Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from the risen Lord. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And since he lives, we too will live. We have that joyous word, this word from God. In fact, it's the only word that can really console and comfort us. In the face of smaller buffets in life, but against the big hard blows that we sometimes face because of the enemy and the power of death. The power of death manifests itself in many ways, whether it's an infant that dies only after three weeks of life, or it's a tragic school shooting, or a bank shooting, or 9-11, or a destructive tornado that levels a town nearby, an automobile accident that takes the life of a man as it did yesterday, or a slow killing chronic disease. Because he lives, we too shall live. And we have the great power, as St. Paul uses in our, or St. Luke uses in our first lesson, the great power and the great grace to face these small to big to huge to massive blows that come to us. Thomas, sometimes called the doubter, had one of those huge blows of the size of Lord and God, his Lord and his God had been killed. And the only way to describe it was for him, his world fell apart. Everything in his life that he was holding on to let go. It was all lost. His everything was broken and it couldn't be put back together again. Thomas himself was shattered with his world. We all know that we too must grieve, and grieve we do. Each perhaps somewhat personally, but there are some things that we have in common. Grief is, after all, the other side of love. We who grieve little, love little. We who grieved not at all, loved not at all. Of grief, we can also say that it comes and goes with the memory of events, smells, all kinds of things. The core teaching of the Bible is that God has dealt with the blow of death the enemy, and sin. It will not win. We cannot understand this. We cannot accept it. It has to take hold of us as a truth. God has to take hold of us, just as Jesus came to the disciples on that week, that Sunday morning, that Easter day, and eight days later came to Thomas. It was he who had to take the initiative, as he has done in your baptism, grabbing a hold of you. Great power, great grace, wonderful. How sad it is that Thomas felt that it was the other way around. You see, Thomas was not just doubting, he was disbelieving. He didn't believe that a God anywhere worth being called his God, should suffer shame and death on a cross. He did not believe any Lord, being such a Lord, could go that way. So Thomas's grief was much more than just doubt. It was despair. We have all kinds of therapeutic studies now about grief, but I think if you read the Bible, especially Job or Ecclesiastes, 
Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. All is loss. All of life is dealing with loss. From the moment we are born and we lose that beautiful, wonderful, warm, cozy environment and are thrust into a world of cold and hunger, everything that we experience involves loss. And it's our life challenge to get a hold of it. But we never will. Vanity of vanities. As Job said, unless I see my Redeemer come, I have no hope. I know that my Redeemer lives, he said. How do people deal with vanity and loss? How do you deal with it? We have experienced all kinds of heartbreak in our lives, disillusionment. Some people turn to hate. Some people become like the evil that attacks them, and they say, rather give in to it than fight it. That's one of the reasons why we have something called Lent. Lent is the season when we struggle against the power of evil in our lives. And Thomas seems to have dealt with it in his own way. But one thing we are sure of, he was not in the fellowship. He was not in the sharing that went on that first Easter. We are seeing that today in our time, in churches are all over Northern Hemisphere and Europe and other places. The people of the resurrection are not coming to share in the fellowship. And we, like they, sometimes we do, we say, unless the Lord does it my way, I will not believe. And that's sad. You and I need to struggle against that kind of self-centered demand. Good as our struggle is, even if we're the best at struggling to overcome that kind of doubt and despair, we need to understand the dynamic of the Lord, risen Lord, and how he needs to take a hold of us. That is the key, the great grace that is mentioned in our first lesson. Grace is not earned. It's a free gift of God, not of works, lest any one of us should boast. We didn't invent the cross. We didn't think of the resurrection, but the Lord who is God is the one who has overcome it, taken that darkness into his life. In his book, Auschwitz, about Auschwitz, Ailey V. Sale writes about a child, a boy, that was hung on a gallows and all of the people in the concentration camp were forced to watch as he was killed. And one in the crowd yelled out, where is God? Where is the Lord? And another person responded, God is there hanging on the gallows. That answer is so important for us as Christians to see that our disillusionment with God is often a result of our illusion that God cannot take that kind of suffering. That God cannot have that kind of lordship and love for us. It can also mean a breakthrough to the fact that God reaches out and takes hold of us takes hold concretely of our life and our situation. There's always much more that we can say. In our age, there are people who deny that miracles happened. Well, if you don't believe in the miracle of miracles, the death and resurrection of Jesus, you will never see the other miracles that happen because of his love. Jesus reaches us by letting his wounds receive our sin, his wounded side. 
in that our sin enters him and his blood flowing out from him gives life. Thomas needed proof that he was the Lord who had died, that it was his God who had died, not just a man, but Lord and God. And thank God that Jesus comes to us in the bread and the wine, the breaking of bread, the prayers that we share here, just as he did. He comes through the ugly, the ungodly, and the unlordly things that happen in our days. We see all kinds of people every day to whom we are sent. When he came, he said that he it was said he breathed on them and gave them peace. Even as I am sent, so I send you. He sends us to people who are neglected, abused, in despair, especially to children. Those children who are neglected. St. Paul says in our lesson, if we have, in our life have only hope for this life, we are of all people most to be pitied. Thomas was a skeptic, and we live in a skeptical age. It does us no good to demonize him or to lift him up to some automatic sainthood. I've been watching a little bit of a show. It's called... Uh, Living Biblically, have any of you seen that? It's on television now. And uh, it's really a mockery of the meaning of the risen Lord Jesus. You see, the core of the Bible is the God who suffers in love is the God who is raised in Jesus Christ. There's no set of rules the Ten Commandments show us our need for that Savior. It's not possible to live by the norms and the values of the Bible without having that core of a wounded, suffering, but risen Lord Jesus. As a child growing up, I grew up on Disney. I think a lot of generations are still growing up on Disney. And Disney tries to avoid the harsh realities of love. Love is always going to have suffering and pain in it. One of my favorite Disney characters is Jiminy Cricket. And the song goes like this. Some of you who are children may even know it. When you wish upon a star makes no difference who you are. Anything your heart desires will come to you. If your heart is in your dream, no request is too extreme. When you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. Oh, wouldn't it be nice if our wish dreams and the world would conform to them. But we learn three very distinct things from Jesus and his encounter with Thomas. First of all, the world does have pain and suffering. And there is grief, even for little children. And this is not a little fable. But we learn by being known and graciously by the Lord who takes hold of us. Secondly, we learn that this plays out in our lives when God is the one who sends us, sends us into the world to share that love. And thirdly, we need to recognize that as we say those words, my Lord and my God, it means that we live with those wounds and we show ourselves to the world in that shape of love. St. Paul said, the greatest of these is love. That is very powerful in its impact, even for those who just want the facts, the hard, cold facts. 
We've lost our way when we've lost the hope and the power of the risen Lord. As our first lesson from Acts says for today, in the fellowship of the risen Lord Jesus, we receive the greatest forms of love. In the breaking of bread, in the prayers, and the confessing of our faith. Would you like to experience that? The only way to experience it is to receive it as a gift and to give it as a gift. Amen.